general, specifically the last snap pull of the dungeon. But first, we've got to start it off with Plaguefall. That's right. Let's dive into it. We've got Echo versus Reload Fulcrum starting up right now in Plaguefall. All right. Well, let's see what those two teams can show us today. Um, the thing with the time trials, right? This is a time trial dungeon, as uh, they just talked about, and seven minutes difference between those two teams. It's going to be hard for them to overcome, but Echo streamed their time trials and their cup practice, right? So after um, actually qualifying for the tournament, Reload Fulcrum could have actually just uh, checked the VODs or checked um, the stream of Echo and maybe adjusted their strategy a little bit to be slightly faster. We'll see what happens. Yeah, for sure. And I think I also want to point out how much of a time increase we've seen this week compared to last week's Plague Falls. Our good broadcast times in Plague Fall were 20 minutes. We saw an 18 minute run on the time trials from Echo. So that's a two minute increase. But starting off essentially the same as last week on the side of Echo here, doing a massive triple pull with the giant here. But you have to remember with this bolstering affix, you really have to focus down that giant because it has more HP than everything else. And if it gets too big, it could be an issue for the teams, but not for Echo. Just have that one Plague Stormer left behind or Fungal Mancer rather and uh, they'll be moving on with the rest of the dungeon here. Yeah, that was a really fast pull. We see the percentage now at the top. It's 14% for Echo, while a real Falcrum just looks like they're doing the same pull or a similar pull percentage-wise, uh, but 13% on their side, so slightly less, but they're just uh, quite a bit slower with that bolstering management. Bolstering is going to be incredibly important when it comes to these kind of... Um, time trial just speed runs right because you just want to make sure that you're not only because the mobs of course if they bolster they also do more damage to the tank but also just because the, of the increased hp that they gain just making the pulls last longer if you don't manage it perfectly and that's something echo did in the past really really well yeah and we're seeing this hatchling nest tech that we saw perplexed using in the first week coming out from both teams here uh very similar strategy from what we saw in the first week for, with perplexed and uh it's something that I think we're going to see a lot in the coming weeks, people kind of consolidating strats, especially like we were talking about just a couple seconds ago with Echo streaming their practice, so a lot of teams can just kind of look to them for most of their dungeon strats and then try to try to sort of echo them, no pun intended. But uh, here's another interesting change as well coming into this week from the first cup. In the past couple of weeks, Manifestations of Pride were changed so that they now see stealth at a much larger range than, I, than they used to so that it's a lot more difficult or might maybe even impossible to just completely skip them even with Shadow Meld. So teams are going to have to essentially find a way to deal with every single Prideful uh, more efficiently. Yeah, uh, this is definitely a Prideful, for example, that they skipped last time around, right? Last cup, mm -hmm. we've seen almost every team skip this very first Prideful while Echo just dealt with it. And now they're pulling the boss um, with that pride buff, making sure they get a little bit of extra damage here, which, to be honest, is, seems to be like a good strategy as well, because what we've seen in the past was that they skip the pride, but they pull the plague borers on top of the boss because they do explode and leave a dot behind that does a huge amount of damage to the boss. So that's the strategy they, they played last time around. And this time it looks like they're not pulling those plague borers. They're probably going to save it for some trash later while using the pride buff for this boss. Yeah, and they're just bursting it down with the un with the, pretty much all the cooldowns. Look at the unholy DK burst with bloodlust and uh, and the prideful buff here. Unholy DK, of course, one of the strongest forty second you know damage dealers in the game. Once they have their army, the dead up as long as they're the cooldowns. Uh, they, they do a lot of that single target burst, so that's going to be very useful in this dungeon, specifically in tyrannical, in order to deal with these more difficult bosses. But I'm interested to see now, especially on bolstering, what they plan on doing with those plague borers coming up after this boss, because like we saw, like we were talking about earlier, they used those plague borers to kill the boss last week, so they would have cooldowns available for trash afterwards. But obviously, they haven't pulled the plague borers on top of the boss here, so I'm interested to see what the uh, change in strategy is. Yeah, we'll see what they do with them now. Unfortunately, on the other side, uh, Reload Falcrum having quite a few issues. They had a full team wipe on uh, in the middle of the trash pack when they also had the Pride spawn. And that's usually, uh, that definitely is one of the more difficult points in the fight when you have that Pride spawn, right? Because uh, if the Pride spawns in the middle of a trash pack, then all of a sudden you have to deal with the trash on top of also having to deal with the Pride. A bunch of bolstering stacks as well on that trash and it was just too much for them to handle. And then once you have some people die, you just it's just kind of unrecoverable because you don't have enough battle races at the start of the dungeon to recover that pool. And the Pride just keeps stacking the debuff up, doing more and more AoE damage. So it's just... Uh, it was just impossible for them to recover, so they had to do a full reset, everyone had to release, and now they're re-engaging that pride. So Echo definitely very, very far ahead at this point as they've done the first boss and they're up to 29% dealing with those Plague Borers now. 
And it looks like they have, do they have all three Plague Bores in there? They do. Now, of course, these Plague Bores are target capped. They only hit five targets. So when they do explode, they're not really going to do damage to everything. But it looks like they're just not even going to worry about the Plague Bore damage. They're just going to AoE them down themselves with that un uncapped <laughs> AoE of the Mage and the Unholy Decay just slamming everything down. And no big issue. They have a Plague Bore left for the Prideful. They don't have any cooldowns up, but the Plague Bore will be all the damage they need to take that Prideful down. And things are going to be looking nice and good for Echo here. Doppler effect, sorry, <laughs> Reload Fulcrum, they used to be called Doppler effect. Reload Fulcrum, another death here on the skip here. It looks like they're just uh, fr falling further and further behind, unfortunately. Yeah, really not looking too good for them. Um, the other thing is when you have these wipes that we see for Reload Fulcrum here, it's um, just, you have a plan when you go into a dungeon, right? Especially with, with a time trial dungeon. You know exactly what you want to do at what point in a dungeon. You have completely mapped out the dungeon, you know exactly when to use cooldowns. So if something goes wrong like that, and you have a complete reset of a pool, all of a sudden, none of your cooldowns match up anymore at the point where you want them. And then it just increases the difficulty of these pulls that they want to do. So that's why it's hard for Real Life Fulcrum to get back into this dungeon at this point. But they did manage to pull that boss. They have the Bloodlust available for it as well. So hopefully they can finish this off. But yeah, I could just, uh, having zero mistakes at this point, um, zero deaths, 52% trash, first boss down. So it's going to be incredibly hard for Reload Fulcrum to catch up here unless Echo makes uh, a mistake later, which definitely can happen. Because Plaguefall, um, if you don't manage those Plague Bores properly, then it can definitely cause some issues. Yeah, and I'm wondering if we're probably not going to see too many of the Plague Bores used for a lot of trash here. Like, for instance, in live push keys, even you know when people are getting into the 22s and 23s on Fortified, you essentially just use these Plague Bores that spawn with the mini boss that Echo's on right now to kill essentially every trash pack between the first boss and the second boss. And then you finish it off, you finish off this sort of gauntlet area by using the uh, the Plague Bores to kill both the mini boss and the Prideful that spawns from it afterwards. But I think in this 18 tyrannical scenario, with the cooldowns that they have available to them, they can kind of just AoE burst as much trash down as they want to when they have them available, especially when you're abusing the uh, the interaction between the Fire Mage's Combust, Kindling, and Shifting Power with that Fey Guardians from the Disc Priest. They just they can just have Combust up pretty much whenever they want. So they don't really need to abuse that too much. However, you are seeing the Plague Borer interaction here. They killed the mini boss, Plague Borers spawn, the Plague Borers both blow up on top of the Prideful and they essentially kill the Prideful for you so you can have all of your cooldowns available for the next trash pull right afterwards. Yeah, and as you said, they basically just used the Plague Borers to do that tentacle area and the mini boss. And then they also uh, made sure they're killing the, uh, the mini boss not too early so they get that last set of plague borers spawning for the pride and now they're just moving on doing this without any of those plague borers which uh, to be honest as you mentioned on an 18 is definitely doable and sometimes we've seen this before right we've seen teams um abuse these kind of dungeon mechanics to like every small little detail and they set it up perfectly and we had all of this trash being gathered and everything perfectly succeed and abused but then in the end because the setup takes so long it wasn't actually worth it and that's probably what echo figured out as well that's why we had two minute faster dungeon time at least i assume so they just figured you know what we're not going to be uh, pulling stuff backwards and backtracking to make to abuse those plague borers we're just gonna press w go forward and just do whatever um, we can with the plague borers and then we move on and that's exactly what they're doing here and it seems to be incredibly fast as we're eight minutes into the dungeon they're already up to 70 percent trash and are now fighting ikis they're all standing in this uh, AoE zone that got dropped um, from one of the slimes here to just get the haste increase as well. And I also like the uh, the change in strategy from last week that, that Echo has adopted after after losing to Perplex. They kind of added that pull in from Perplex for the extra trash count they needed before the first boss, and spawned that Prideful there, just an adaptation to the new strat to the new meta where you can't really skip Pridefuls. And what they probably ended up dropping from the previous route is that one kind of awkward trash pack off to the right, right before the third boss that they did, right? You kind of just went out of your way to get the last uh, bit of trash percentage they needed. Because when you're at that 70% trash, they only need about 14 or 15% more before they get to the final boss where, you know, you're forced to, do, to deal with the rest of that trash before you spawn the final boss of the dungeon. So they really don't need to pull that much other than what's between them and the next boss after Ickus goes down. So I, I like the adaptation from week one to week two. It's really shown to pay off for them, I feel like. It's just a much better route, especially with the changes that came in last week. And, uh, I mean, just judging based off of the time trial times, it's uh, worked out in spades for them. Yeah, definitely. And we do see this uh, adaptation as well 
uh, with the plague bomb just letting it explode on that second platform. That's something um, Echo did not do at the start, but then we saw another team just completely ignoring the plague bomb, using AMC and uh, that disc bubble, and using every immunity and defense that they have available to just completely survive the explosion, which just saves you a couple of seconds too, because you don't have to waste the damage on the plague bomb and you, ju you can just keep DPSing the boss. So just trading some defensive cooldowns to uh, increase the speed of that um, boss timer. And it's really worth it. As you can see, the boss died so incredibly quickly. Looks like they're doing a skip here now. They are all night elves, so they all have their shadow melt available. Uh, they just walked past the tentacle. I assume Maris used his um, in-cap to CC it, and then after this pack, they're just going to be um, shadow melting off the aggro. Yep, for sure. And like, like, you know, another adaptation from the changes where you can't shadow meld pridefuls anymore, just opting to use your shadow meld to skip other trash. That's kind of just in the way that they don't need because they've they've uh, changed the rut up to incorporate other trash. So yeah, just we're going to be seeing changes from week to week. And this is one of the first sort of adaptations we'll see. And I'm interested to see how that prideful change affects routes in other dungeons as well. If there's any trash that they felt like they were forced to do before because they had to shadow meld pridefuls to be effective, uh, I wonder if they'll be able to shadow meld certain trash packs that were a little more difficult because of that. Yeah, so this is a huge pull, actually, as they walk into this third boss room and just pull two or three packs even together. We do see one CC on the sniper, uh, probably because he's the one having the highest HP, this bolstering after all, so they want to make sure they do have even damage. And the sniper is also very difficult to deal with as well, if you don't have enough interrupts uh, to deal with his mechanics. And it also just moves uh, very badly because it just shoots even if you're out of range. So it looks like they spawned that fourth pride here. They're up to 80% trash. And yeah, just really well done on that pull. It looked so easy right when you see those mdi pulls you see them just pulling three trash packs together and they're just gripping it all and just aoeing it down and it looks so simple when they do it but obviously this is very difficult and they have to perfectly align all of their uh, cds and their um cc's as well to make sure none of those casts are going through and then of course also perfect bolstering management as well now they have that sniper paralyzed over on the left side and we, we did talk about how they could have used their shadow mold to skip that tentacle previously, but they haven't used their shadow molds. They're still all off cooldown. So I wonder what the plan is for those. Uh, maybe they're going to be getting rid of their aggro one, maybe the ambusher and the sniper here. Because I'm pretty sure they're good on count now. I don't think they need any more for the rest of the dungeon here. The trash in the bottom room could be enough. Uh, something that I think could be a strategy for some of the teams is in dungeons where you have the unholy DK available to on your team, what you can do is you can use them to... Uh, uh, control on dead one of the mobs, which is a DPS loss for them, so it's probably not going to be something. But they could use that for the last trash count they need for a dungeon, and after they've dealt with the final boss, they could release it, finish it off, get their trash count, and not have to deal with the fifth prideful. But I don't know if that'd be worthwhile for uh, the, the damage loss that it is for the Unholy DK. But, you know, just, just a thought. Yeah, that's definitely an idea. Uh, we do see that they actually use Bloodlust specifically for this boss now, and oh, they yeah, also use sense. PI on uh, on the DK as well. So that's why the DK is doing so much damage. This is basically pure single target damage that he's doing uh, up until those ad spawn, of course. That uh, So there's some AOE involved, but uh, a lot of it is single target damage with all the big cooldowns coming out of this unholy DK. So definitely lots and lots of damage. The Venom Sniper and the Ambusher still are to see. And as you said, they're up to 85% trash, so they definitely do have enough uh, to go down, but we still have the Shadow Melt available, so even if someone is in combat with those, which they definitely are, because the Sniper is part of the left trash pack, so they definitely are in combat with that, um, but they can just Shadow Melt off the aggro if they... Right. They'll, they'll just for sure it. Shadow Melt here. You can see all the Shadow Melts coming out. Now it's the only one left, and there it goes. They're out of combat with everything. Not an issue for them whatsoever. And all that's left between Echo and, you know, uh, a far cleaner run than most of the ones they had last week is uh, just this final boss room here. Probably just going to run past these first two plague bound devotees, let them trickle in, or maybe you have one of the players just solo them while they all move in and start dealing with the rest of them all the way down here. There's actually 15 or 16 of them down here, so there's a lot of them to deal with. Massive AoE coming out here pretty soon, but the combust isn't available, so it might take a little while. Yeah, the problem when you have two melee in this room is that <laughs> these devoted are a little bit hard for them to damage because the tank cannot actually tank them so um usually you just have the range dps deal with them and just kite them out because they're incredibly slow so they're not actually going to hit you if you attack them from range but uh, of course two melee uh, make it a little bit harder that's why it looks like they're going one by one 
Um, but the most important damage in this room is not even the AoE anyway, it's the mm -hmm. single target damage on the mini boss on Acre because that's going to be the one that survives for the longest. So the rest of the mobs should just random, should just die from the from the splash, from the cleave damage, and the passive AoE. So um, as long as you have enough single target damage here, you're actually going to be doing the boss faster. And looks like um, they actually killed the mini boss first before the devoter. Wow. Okay, that's something you never see yeah. usually. <laughs> That's definitely something we're not used to seeing on live keys at all, because it has yeah. so much more HP than Plaguebound Devoted's when you get into high keys. It takes a long time to kill that, especially with all the ghost walks it does. But yeah, that's actually, I think, the more efficient thing to do, because it's easy to finish off the Devoted's afterwards, right? They are going to yeah. be... What are they going to be doing with this Prideful here? They just um, walk away from it. You they just walk away from it. I wonder what they did to do that. I... Does Invisbot Invis work on that? Huh. Yeah, that must be what it is. I think so, yeah. Yeah, sure. Invisibility Potion still works for Pridefuls here, and that makes sense because it's the last one in the dungeon. They don't need it for this boss because the phases of this boss are so quick that the damage amp really doesn't do much for you. It just does like a, you know, makes you yeah. push the phase like maybe like five seconds faster. And the only real like pain point that you're trying to skip in most of these phases is skipping the second Infectious Raincast, which they should be able to do very easily here, pushing the boss at 66%. So yeah, it makes sense to not really need that for this fight at all. Yeah, especially because the boss goes down here in the intermission phase and you still have the pride buff in this phase here and it doesn't do anything for you, right? Because the only thing that it increases is the damage on these devoted here, which is not really needed because they don't have to die. So, um, yeah, it just seems like the for this boss specifically, it's, it's not worth it to kill the pride for them unless they would struggle to not uh, have enough damage for those double rains. But even then, they can probably just out heal the double rain anyway. So yeah, for speed on the boss, it's just not worth it. That's why we see that skip coming up. But yeah, the only skip, interestingly enough, in this dungeon, because uh, they definitely had the possibility to skip it. So interesting to see that they only choose to skip that very last one. And if you weren't convinced that Echo wasn't planning on coming back, coming back with a vengeance, Take a look at this time here. They finished number one on time trials with an 1810 in Plaguefall. All they have left between them and finishing this dungeon off is like a 30 second intermission phase and then 30% of the boss's HP. And they have cooldowns coming up for that final phase here. They're going to beat their time trials time, I feel like. And uh, these guys are playing much better than they did last week. They have much more, they had a much more refined route in this dungeon. And if this is kind of like a precursor to how they're going to be playing for the rest of the weekend, we're going to see some insane games between them and Perplex later on if both teams are here to play. Yeah, this is definitely an incredible time. You can see the boss is coming back up 17 minutes into the fight. So they're definitely going to be faster than their time trial time, which is insane because they already had such a fast time, two minutes faster than the fastest run we've seen uh, in the last cup. So just insane speed in this dungeon and bolstering as well, right? Bolstering is something that should usually slow you down even further, but not for Echo. They seem to be not caring about that at all and the boss is about to go down they're gonna go 1-0 against reload falcon in this first Ooh. game with what a time wow absolute phenomenal performance here by echo taking game number one and <laughs> annihilating their time trial time as well here dreno 1742 yeah i mean it's incredible that they were able to make this happen you know, when you're in this situation where you finish time trials, then you get all these new dungeons that you need to learn and practice and get the affixes for. And somehow Echo, in the time when that was something they had to do, they also were able to improve on their time trial dungeon run here in Plaguefall, which was already the best of any team's run in the time trials. So uh, really convincing and uh, impressive first map of, t of the day from them. Yeah, and I know, you know, with bolstering, you talked about it quite a bit last week as well, Dranos, where it's kind of one of these affixes that you don't really notice when you're watching the teams. You're like, oh, just everything just goes super smoothly. But the amount of work and target swapping they have to do just really can't be understated for these guys. Yeah, bolstering is, is one of those affixes where if it's done well, it is pretty invisible, right? You know, things, things are just dying around the same time. Not much extra health and damage is being added. But the amount of routing decisions that have to be made to make that feasible, very high. We saw a lot of that with mobs getting crowd controlled and then skipped later. Uh, that kind of thing can really help you manage mobs that are either difficult to group in or have different health values from the others. That's a good way to, to manage bolstering. Uh, and then also just prioritizing your damage within a pull, making sure that each mob is receiving damage proportional to how much health it has relative to the rest of the pack. It's not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to coordinate, but 
when it's done well, it makes the affix look so, so clean. Oh no, most definitely. And you know, let's start going through the replay here as well, because Echo just, you know, like you said, improving on their time trial time, being able to stream all of the time trials and practice and everything, they really showed up. Yeah, credit to Reload Fulcrum as well. Besides this wipe that they uh, they ran into on the first Pride, things were looking relatively good for them as well. Obviously, Echo just kind of on another level here. We can see this refinement of the Dr. Ickes strategy uh, that was developed in the last cup as well here. Letting that Plague Bomb go off, just stacking some cooldowns. Barely even scratches the team there. Lowest player dropping just shy of 70% health. And then just a complete ignore of the second Plague Bomb. This is tyrannical, by the way. This is not something that... Uh, that looks particularly easy to do, or that is particularly easy to do, but they make it look pretty easy. And then, of course, that last pride. And yes, you can see the Invis pots coming out. Uh, so not Shadow Meld, but Invis pot and run away from the manifestation of pride uh, allowed them to skip that there. Not a technique that I was familiar with, but uh, something that looks really strong and uh, <laughs> one that I imagine other teams will be uh, will be looking to use as well. That's what allowed Echo to uh, to shave off time from their already impressive time trial time here in this dungeon. Yeah, and we were talking, you know, a little bit as well before a broadcast here, Zyro, about how Prideful was going to be able to have True Sight, but there still is that potential for some of those skips to be able to get away from them fast enough. Yeah, I, I was convinced that we weren't going to see any major Prideful skips there, but, you know, if, if invisibility potions work, if you're outside of the aggro radius of it, then so be it. But of course, using your invisibility potion is a pretty major investment, right? No DPS potions for the next five minutes. So, you know, it's kind of a trade-off, you know, DPS potion or skip a Prideful. And in that situation, yeah, you, you skip the Prideful for sure, because you just don't need it for that boss. Yeah, and, you know, that's also going to just kind of angle our conversation here, Nagura, as well, to Necrotic Wake. And we were talking before, you know, weapons are getting mixed up quite a bit here. We have some of the prideful changes coming in, different set of affixes coming up right now as well. We have Fortified Spiteful, Volcanic. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm interested to see what they're going to be doing with this, because we've seen rogues the last time around. Every single team was running a rogue because it would enable this kind of necropolis snapping pool where all the trash would just be snapped down to the tank and then you use the, the orbs and the weapons to just AOE them all down. But this is obviously not going to be working out anymore because of the cap of the AOE that the weapons are going to be doing now. I think it's capped to eight targets at most. So um, either they're still going to do the pool and just try to damage them with their own damage abilities, which is going to be incredibly difficult because those mobs do a lot of damage to the tank. But at the same time, we also got some nerfs recently from um, on live servers as well for these mobs on the Necropolis. We also have seen um, other nerfs overall for less tank damage, so it might be possible for them to do the same thing still and just AOE it down with the Fire Mage, right? Yeah, that's a great point as well. A lot of dungeon nerfs coming up onto this one here. Dratnos, you know, trying to make it so the tanks are less inclined to kite, but it still seems to be very much, you know, a lot of pressure on these tanks to be able to survive the pulls that they're doing in MDI. Yeah, I mean, it, it's no surprise that when you're pulling 20 or 30 mobs, <laughs> uh, it's often time to run away once once you're out of, of meta, out of demon spikes, whatever the case may be. Uh, I think that, that makes perfect sense. And it's impressive the amount with which the, the amount of damage these tanks are actually able to withstand the pulls that they've been able to pull off uh, so far that we've seen. Necrotic Wake is definitely one that has changed a lot in the past couple of weeks. There's been a, a couple of changes uh, to a bunch of trash mobs uh, and, of course, to the entire weapon paradigm, which, yeah, I think this is probably the candidate for the dungeon that will look the most different from last cup. Yep, yeah, and then... If I'm not mistaken, I don't think any of the changes for the dungeons affected rogues and their legendaries. They're still going to be able to use that uh, legendary to be able to big, give big damage out. Well, the target capping of the weapons is True. going to be a reduction on the damage of that strategy. Uh, and that may make it so that it's not something that is feasible to do as much. I expect that, yeah, the rogues will still be using that legendary, the uh, Master Assassin 100% crit, combining it with the weapons. But whether you can do it to try and kill 20 mobs or whether you, yeah. you scale that back now to 10, uh, that that sort of thing, I think, is is an open question. How does sure. the spear work with, with the damage reduction? Does it, does it just reduce the initial damage, or does it reduce the, the dot damage as well? Uh, I believe that all the weapons now will deal their damage 
divided. So uh, beyond eight targets, they'll do the same damage divided evenly among all targets. So okay. uh, mm. I think that means that the damage taken increase from the spear will still apply, and that might still be uh, viable. Yeah, if I had to well, guess, that strategy is still completely possible. They just have to use like two spears and then two orbs. But yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Game's ready to get underway. Game number two is Echo is up one versus Reload Fulcrum. Okay, let's see if there's going to be any rogues in uh, these comps here, because without the rogue, that strategy is not possible at all, because you do need that tricks of the trade and also the rogue survivability to be able to do that pull. And there we go. We do see the rogue on Echo's side. So let's see later on how they're going to be pulling this off. But first of all, they need to do this first boss room. And we see now gathering an insane amount of trash and the boss as well. So huge pull coming in here at the start with Bloodlust being popped as well. So let's see that <laughs> fire mage damage. Hey, hey, check it out. The rogue bursted for 400k. No issues there. Wonder what he did. I think he used a spear if I had to guess. But check it out, the mage is catching up off of pure raw combustion AoE alone. But now they have a prideful that they have to deal with on top of this boss as well, and they still have all of these spitefuls chasing them around, as well as the carrion worms from the boss. So it's going to be a little scary, they're going to have to kite around a little bit, but once those once those uh, spitefuls are gone, there's not too much to worry about. They just have to worry about that pulsing AoE damage from the prideful. So wow, Echo just crushing it already on their end. Reload Fulcrum on their end did go for a similar size pull, but, but they didn't do it with the boss, so they're losing out on a lot of free boss damage here. You can see Echo getting it down to already 40%, but that prideful is ticking, but now that it's dead, they should be in the clear. Yes, and they used um, they used the weapon so smartly as well, right? We, we had the spear at the start, as you mentioned, from the rogue. And then the rogue, uh, playing Kyrian, walked over to that uh, goliath, activated the goliath, and then everyone picked up those orbs to heal through the pride. Because the anima exhaust, the orbs that you can pick up that spawn out of the goliath, um, not only does it do a pulsing AoE around you, but it also heals around you. So this is actually very, very efficient to be able to survive this pride. So very, very smart usage of the weapons here and of the um, just things they have available to them. So insane by Echo, 28% trash and the boss done. Well, Real Life Fulcrum, as we said, they did a very similar pull. They're up to 24% trash, so not that far behind. But they have to do the boss without those weapons, without the damage increase, and everyone's out of offensive cooldown. So this is going to take a while for them to finish off that boss. All right. So if we're if we're going to see a similar strategy to what we saw before, I think what we're going to have to see is probably the mage picking up an orb plus the uh, spear, and then they also have the rogue go up top, do the same. Uh, snap strat and then they'll grab an orb afterwards but yeah there's still a lot left in this dungeon to go here going for another decently sized pull here on top of this mini boss there's a lot of casts that need to be interrupted here if any of them get off on your group it could be kind of painful especially those necrotic bolts coming in from narza to the mini boss here but it looks like they're dealing with everything pretty clean here the aoe is enough from the fire mage to take everything down without too much of an issue yeah, and one thing we didn't mention is uh, Spiteful as well. This very first pull they did in the first boss room, that can be incredibly dangerous when you have so many trash mobs dying and then Spiteful spawning all over the place, considering that they also have two melee, right? We have a Rogue who has to uh, deal with those Spitefuls, and we also have Maris on the Windwalker, uh, which, you know, we, we do know how difficult it can be to uh, survive these Spitefuls when they just start spawning all over the place, but good job. Uh, dealing with that without any issues whatsoever. And it looks like Fragrance went back there and picked up a weapon. Fragrance is really on the utility duty here in this whole dungeon. Yeah. You can just see him run around all over the place, picking up weapons, going back and forth. And there we go. Fragrance picking up that orb uh, for the next pull. Oh, wait. Wait, wait, wait. Didn't they make a change to Necrotic Wake with the weapons too that you don't lose them when you die? Yeah, I, exactly. I believe they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, it doesn't matter if he picks up the weapons because he can just go up, snap the trash down, and then it doesn't matter. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I was thinking the mage was going to have to pick them up, but no, no dice. He can just do whatever he wants. He can, he can just have them on the rogue. All right, cool. Ooh, so yeah, they're the going to be shroud? skipping. Would this shroud skip fail here? No, 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 no. They're just keeping everyone else out of combat while they're gathering okay, up the yeah. trash. That's but that looked thing. a little bit yeah, sketchy. <laughs> that looked very sketchy here. The combustion right, so is up, is but the there's... All that they want to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. And looks like we used the orb. Yeah, definitely. You can see the rogue damage, so we definitely used the orb. Um, two AOE down this pool. We see the pride spawning as well. They're up to 63% trash. And uh, did the, did Jinji use combustion? Yes, he did. Yeah, he I did, mean, did. it is up very frequently, so he can just um, 
since they have to use it, they have to kill the pride anyway. It makes sense for him to just use his cold lance on top of also using that uh, orb. Man, do they still only need one orb for this next pull? Is that is that is that it? Like, I feel like the target count. You think should they're be still gonna do it? That. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think they're still gonna do it. hundred percent. Why, why else would you have a rogue in this dungeon, right? It's not like it's that strong. You could, you could, you could just. I mean, put it is the, still uh... very strong, right? With the with the weapons. Sure, I mean, but the thing with the thing is, like, you can just put it on the mage with combust too. It's still it's one hundred percent crit either way, right? Uh, the anima orb does not scale with combustion, as far as I'm aware. The spear does, does but the orb does not. Huh. Oh, no. Yeah, so it doesn't fine. work. Huh. Okay. Well, I'm wrong then. <laughs> Dumb caster. At over least we here. tested it recently <laughs> on. It, it, maybe they changed it with the recent patch too, because uh, we definitely tested it just like today, and it did not scale with the combustion. But um, it? it might be something they might have changed recently. Because they did change the weapons, right? So maybe that's something they addressed? Yeah. I, I, I didn't know. I, I just thought, I just assumed it worked with combustion, but I guess, I guess I'm just completely wrong about that. But yeah, coming up here, we're going to see them dealing with Amarth here. And then after Amarth is going to be what everyone's keeping their eye on, right? If the rogue goes up alone, it's time. It's game time. Because they're going to be going for that <laughs> massive snap pull. With the un, with the target cap day we of the weapons now, and we're gonna see if that's gonna have any major lasting effects on them because this is still an 18 fortified dungeon here, as you can see by those affixes at the bottom of the screen, which means some of this trash, if it's not dealt with properly, can be a pain if it's not instantly blown up. Now there were a lot of nerfs to some of the tank damage up top, so the tanks are gonna be in as much dire straits as they were two weeks ago, but it's still a relatively difficult trash. You're pulling everything upstairs at the same time, so yeah, it's gonna be pretty difficult to deal with. Definitely. And I mean, look at the time, right? We are six minutes into the dungeon and they're about to finish off Amar. So that's in just incredible speed. Um, I think we've seen, I mean, we've seen some some fast runs last time around in the last cup, but it seems like they're just gonna, they're just getting faster and faster and just doing incredible pulls in this dungeon with those weapons, even with the cap. It looks like they don't even care about that target cap. They're just still doing these insane pulls. And we also see the CC come out here, the shackle, uh, shackle undead, and also the ink cap by Maris, by the Windwalker, because uh, when the ads are CC'd, they don't actually explode on the final harvest, so they can just ignore them. And yeah, now we see uh, Fragments walk over there behind the Goliath, picking up the orb, and it looks like they're just going oh. up. Okay, they're so they're not together. doing any snapping. Okay. I assume they tried it, and it might just be too risky. May or maybe they'd have to use too many weapons, because as you said, it's definitely possible to, or I assume it might still be possible to do the pool if you just use multiple weapons on it, but maybe they just figured it's not worth it or it's too risky. I don't know. Either way, it looks like they are not doing any snapping this time around. They're just going up the necropolis, but still just pull everything. They're still pulling. <laughs> so you don't they're have to do snapping when everything. you just pull everything. <laughs> yeah, they're just still pulling everything. You're going to see that burst coming out from Fragments on the Rogue there using the Master Assassin plus the weapons here. And it just doesn't even matter that it's target capped. Everything is dead. They are dropping low, but the Cheat Death hasn't procced on any of the... Um, neither the Cheat Death on the Rogue nor the Cauterize on the Mage was procced here. Now they just have this Prideful with the Fleshcrafter available, so they can just use the Thor Cleavers on the Prideful here. Perfect execution so far on this dungeon from Echo. And, I mean, uh, this is a completely different team from last week. There's, there have been no tiny mistakes from them at all, which is something that was just completely plaguing them two weeks ago. Yeah, I mean, look at the deaths, right? Zero deaths on their side, and just incredible dungeon speed as well. Like, this is this is just insane. We've seen... Uh, we've seen so many people do the snapping pull, and we we thought this is just like the craziest thing you can do. Maris going down, unfortunately, oh, man. We cast as the caster <laughs> curse strikes. <laughs> but we did. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, then we managed to finish off the pride here, as they just have to deal with the creation and the flash crafter that they see it. Um, not not sure exactly why they see it. Um, the flash crafter. Maybe that was just one too many targets they thought um, for the pull before. Maybe they figured, you know what, flash crafters, we don't have interrupt for that um, for that uh, second flash crafter, so we're just going to see it and kill it with the creation after. If um, at some point you run out of interrupts or damage, uh, or I mean, to see and utility, so you just have to to see it and deal with it afterwards. And it seemed to be not costing them too much time at all. Yeah, I feel like that's definitely one of like the least important mobs in terms of like damage in terms of like damage priority. They really want to make sure they get all the stitch works down in that initial AoE, so having a Flesh Crafter available at the end there shouldn't be too big of a deal, and you saw them just easily deal with it, so 
uh, definitely like a safety play sort of deal from them. And I mean, again, they are just completely blasting this dungeon. Uh, another comparison back to last week, if you look at the Necrotic Wake times here from some of our fastest teams, let's take a look at the Necrotic Wakes from last week. If I'm looking at this correctly, a fast Necrotic Wake last week was about around the 20 minute mark, 21 minute mark. So uh, <laughs> they're on pace for like a 15 minute dungeon here. <laughs> so they're going pretty <laughs> fast, I, I would have to say. Yeah, this is, I mean, if you look at the pulls that they were doing, right? They basically pulled as big as they possibly could. The only thing that is slowing them down, slowing them down at this point is the fact that um, these mob groups that they're playing with right now, they don't spawn until you finish it off, right? They literally just cannot do any bigger pulls here. They, uh, they're just being slowed down by the dungeon, limiting them in the amount of trash they can pull at this point. Uh, and they just use all of those weapons perfectly, uh, just min-max all of the pulls they can do. Just incredible dungeon speed by them. Um, after this last pack here, the last one going to be spawning on square. They're, of course, going to be spawning that last pride. They, do you think they're going to skip it? They're out of weapons, so... I mean, they still need to one-face the boss, which might make them play it, but they also have Bloodlust available still, which... Uh, I assume they used it mm. on the first pull, and they just came back up now, right? Because they're 10 minutes into the dungeon, or 10, 11 minutes at this point, so... Um, yeah, maybe they use it on the boss to get the one phase. Not completely sure, because the single target damage that they have, it is pretty high, but sure. um, we'll see. Well, we'll see what they plan. We'll, we'll know what they plan on doing if they start kiting into a corner here once all these spiteful shades are gone, because that means they'll be planning on spawning the prideful in the corner to get away from it. It looks like they're kind of trying to do that. They have to spawn this last speed yeah, disease maybe. in a corner where they're not stacking, so that's why we're, they're maybe not there yet. And then once that speed of disease goes out, they'll probably all kite into this back corner, finish it off quickly. Maybe using the touch of death from Mira's. Yeah, there you go. Perfect, perfect prideful yeah. in the corner. Using the invisibility potions, not going to be dealing with that whatsoever because they don't need it to one phase the boss. And I can't really tell. Does Fragnance have any weapons left on his back there? It doesn't look like it off the top of my head, but you know there could be a spear or two hiding in there behind Zelia's nameplate. So who knows? We'll see. We'll see pretty quickly once Stitch Flesh comes down whether or not they have that available here. Uh, Fragments had the orb, right, when he came up, so it's mm -hmm. someone else who has a weapon, or they don't have one, but uh, with the, with the, doesn't even look like they're using the Bloodlust. Uh, <laughs> so it looks nope. like they're going to be having so much damage that they uh, can just one-face this boss without anything, which uh, is pretty insane. Uh, if they have enough damage without any sort of weapons, just nuking the boss, uh, that they can even save the Bloodlust for the last boss, because... Um, that's something we see a lot, right? Um, a lot of people just use all the weapons they have, all bloodlust, all pride, to one face this boss. And then they go to the last boss, and no one has any offensive cooldowns left, and the last boss takes forever to kill. So Echo looks like they're just gonna play the boss normally, just get the boss down with that third hook from the first creation. And as long as he doesn't jump up again, they're not actually going to be losing too much time. And they can use all of these hooks if they're positioned perfectly Ooh. that actually still work on the boss, right? So this is really well done. <laughs> wow. That's actually really nice getting both of the hooks on one person and being able to position everything perfectly like that. That's That can yeah. be kind of dangerous whenever one person gets both of them at the same time, especially if the hooks are like out of, out of sync, but they're perfectly in sync there, perfect execution there. Echo might even be... <laughs> on pace for a fast in 15 minutes here, which is a ridiculous <laughs> increase in time from last week. And if this oh, is the, the if this is going to be like, ooh, they, oh, they're playing the pride now for the, so for smart, the final boss. Yeah. 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 yeah like and then it. they're going to have bloodlust and that boss is going to melt. Ooh, these guys are nuts. Yeah. That's actually, a, that's actually a really smart idea because uh, the last boss, um, at, at the start, you have all the damage dealers there and you can do a lot of damage but then slowly people are getting sent down to that other side they're getting exiled and you can immune it with them um, with the ice block not 100 sure if cloak works um but they do have the immunities right but maris for example can't do anything against it and if those damage dealers are gone it's just an insane amount of time Boss when they have to just kill that um, that mob there before they can get back up. So it's really smart to just get that um, the pride for the last boss, get the bloodlust as well, and you can see how fast the boss is melting here. So after um, after this initial time when people get exiled, they're out of cooldowns anyway, and it looks like it wasn't Jinji. So he ice blocked the exile. So that was mm -hmm. really That's good RNG, RNG for them. It's perfect to get it on Jinji here, especially because he also had his cooldowns up too.
Jeez, they are going to be shaving so a, fast. a third of the time off of our fastest wow. time last week in the space wow. of two weeks. Echo, man, they are out for blood after losing the cup two weeks ago. They really did not like coming into second place, and they're showing it right now with some absolutely lightning fast runs. Echo taking game number two, and Drago's no time at all passing for this one. They're just getting better and better, truly really showing what they're made of. Yeah, I mean, this was this was a a, uh, a dominating performance from Echo. I mean, this is just an incredible run in both dungeons. Uh, th I mean, there's just not there's not too much more to say about it. I'm sure we will, but. Uh, for now, there's not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dredos. I appreciate that. 